Uh, Professor John Atherton has been pivotal to the Win William Temple Foundation for more years than I've been able to trace back. Uh, John, you were once the chief executive or director, whatever uh, you were called in those days, and you continue to be involved in the foundation at the level of governance, and you continue as our company secretary. Uh, one of your great claims to fame is that you supervise Chris Baker in his uh, doctorate, and therefore uh, was part of arranging your own succession, and you did that not once but twice, also supervising uh, the previous director of research, Malcolm Brown. Uh, John has made, as many of you know, an extensive and very significant contribution to public theology and social ethics in the United Kingdom and well beyond, not least of all, I think, most recently in the United States, uh, but also uh, in Scandinavia. Now today, uh, we're having a very special type of book launch. Uh, we're launching a book that we don't yet have. Uh, we did our very best to deliver the book today, but I think I'm right in saying it's been published on Tuesday next week. So we're having a book launch without the book. Nonetheless, you can say that you were there. So I'm going to ask uh, John if he'd like to come up. And John, you've just got a few moments to tell us a little bit about the book. And then directly after that, I'm going to ask Linda Woodhead if she would also give a response uh, of the book, to the book for us. So thank you, John. Uh, friends, colleagues, um, this book uh, is probably the best book I've written and the most interesting book I've written, but only me think so. Um, normally, if I do a book launch, I stand up and say, the problem is I've changed my mind since I wrote that. I've not. Uh, this is a, a research agenda uh, that will continue till I depart this mortal coil. It's essentially about how do you constructively relate Christianity to economics. And that shaped my life. And this book puts it together, beginning with poverty, marginalization, then market systems, then economics itself, uh, and then into well-being studies. Um, all about re-establishing that connection between economics and Christianity. For the well-being of all, animate and inanimate. That's not been said much today, but it's as big as that, what we're trying to do. Uh, this is a glorious place, I'm not sure nobody else has really mentioned this, to meet here, this context. William Temple was the president of the Workers' Education Association. Um, through the First World War into the 1920s. And it, it was then uh, literally what it said, a Workers' Education Association. And interestingly, uh, the British Secret Service followed him because he was suspicious, because he presided over the Workers' Education Association. There's a reasonably harebrained side to the British Secret Service and to uh, church leadership sometimes. Um, uh, why it's important to meet here is because what I've been writing about is here. That is the transformations in human well-being looked at since the end of the last ice age. You look at the grass in this book. Slow, gradual development of well-being up till the 18th century from 13,000 years ago. Like that, gradual, but then like that. That's called the Industrial Revolution, and I was brought up amongst it. Uh, I was brought up amongst it, and it transformed human well-being in terms of standards of living, and the equally dramatic reduction of poverty. So, I'm no longer dirt poor, as my 
ancestors were from the working classes. And also, in the sense of the second revolution that occurred, in some ways, in this kind of area, Manchester, in the uh, late 19th century, the mortality revolution, which is maybe more important. You'll see a skeleton on the front of the book, and my grandchildren have called it Willyless. You'll look at it and maybe understand Willyless. Um, that means I'm not dead, the mortality revolution. John Robert Atherton was born in 1900, my uncle, uh, and died at uh, the age of three months. I'm nearly 76. That's the difference. That's the difference. So I've got those three perspe two perspectives, income, material, well-being, health, life expectancy, a third one, subjective well-being. And I've looked at those in great detail and constructed a way of linking Christianity to those great secular realities. And then illustrating how it was put to work in the United States and then in Britain. That's what the book's about. Let me read a little bit. It's the afterword, and I love this concept from a, an ecumenical theologian called On Living in More Than One Place at Once. Journeying through the continuing story of the industrial and mortality revolutions generates two contrasting emotions, two sides of the one coin. Their achievements are extraordinarily, mostly in themselves, but also when contrasted with life before 1800. To increase the average income eightfold for the world's inhabitants from 1820 to 1992 gave people the resources to be and to do freed from the ever-present threats of absolute poverty. For that is also what happened when we take into account that even in only 27 years, the end of the 20th century, 700 million people were released from poverty. The results of the mortality revolution were maybe of even greater historic significance for human well-being. In America, life expectancy increased from a meager 47 in 1900, with 20% dying before the age of one to 77 in 2008. My little uncle, John Robert Allerton, who I'm named after, was one of those who died before his first birthday in 1900. I am now 75. Well-being cannot but profit from the near doubling of life, your chances to be and to do, to pursue one's own shelf souls and purposes. I am left with a great sense of Eucharistic awe when faced by such achievements. But then there always comes the deep awareness of the paradox of such development, always present throughout long history, say from the end of the last ice age around 13,000 years ago, but starkly evident in the post-1800 changes and summarized in the massive inequalities between and within nations. It really is astonishing to see that the world's wealthiest nation is now 256 times richer than the poorest. That in terms of people's height, such a key indicator of nourishment and health adequacies, the impressive growth in Europeans' height from 166 centimetres to 178 centimetres in only 140 years contrasts so starkly with the 151 years uh, 50, on, on 51 centimetres in the height of Indians, and that it could take an astounding 200 years for Indian men to catch up with where we Englishmen are now. That fills me with great sadness and a sense of shame. That response to the paradox of development is only compounded by the great threats of the environment. Describing, measuring, and analyzing such changes in human well-being is now a profoundly interdisciplinary exercise. For the economist Easterlin, 
the world's greatest problems are not the problems of any one discipline alone, with their often very protective walls, whether it's say economics or psychology. Rather, the solution to today's problems, he says, recognize multidisciplinary training and research using a variety of relevant and related disciplines. Given the impressive performance of religion in promoting greater subjective well-being, religion too becomes a partner in such cross-disciplinary studies. But such a religious studies must increasingly move beyond any thought of living entirely within a religious grammar. For the tasks of theology and sociology, psychology and economics are united in at least as much as they address the human condition in exploratory and interpretative terms. All these disciplines, and certainly including religious studies, must therefore be concerned in their distinctive ways with life and with how things are with the world of daily life. And that's about being in more than one place at once, about being able to see things from another perspective as well as from one's own, living in more than one place at once. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure I'll write another book because um, I've been working on that agenda. Thank you, John, very much for asking me to uh, respond. And I have seen a copy of the book. I got the manuscript this week. I read it in my reading room, which is virgin trained compartment. Uh, and I can empirically confirm John's hypothesis that it is the best book that he has written. I love this book. John does something remarkable. He, he states the obvious when we haven't quite seen what it is. And he says it honestly, even though we might find it unfashionable or uncomfortable. So as he's mentioned, he says in this book, number one, if religion isn't about human well-being and abundant life, it's not worth bothering with. Number two, economic growth has increased wealth, as we heard, by 8% in a remarkably short period of time, and it's done more to improve well-being than anything else except medicine, and certainly more than religion. Number three controversial statement. If religion is going to count in the world, it's got to be part of political economy. It can't just be a bandage dealing with the problems at the edges, and it can't just be about being a Jeremiah saying how bad the current economic system is. It's got to be part of political economy at the heart of things, helping, contributing to well-being. And then John um, looks historically at how religion and the churches have been part of, were part central to political economy. He looks at how that was the case in the age of atonement, as Boyd Hilton calls them, and the age of incarnation, in the evangelical age, and then the temple era. He shows how central the churches were in the heart of things. And then he hints at what the third era should be, where we are now, and how religion can again uh, regain that central place. And he has some very suggestive things to say about that and about the way in which we have to inhabit more than one place at once and be in many disciplines at once. And he is. In his book, he is in many disciplines. And you will learn a huge amount about economics and medicine and the world and history and theology. So when it appears, you should take advantage and read this book. Thank you, John, for writing it. Thank you, Peter, very much. Uh, Peter suggested that uh, before you know, saying thank yous, I try and summarize what this day has been about. I'm not gonna do that. Suffice to say that I think what we just heard in the last three minutes uh, or last few minutes with John's uh, recounting of his new book and, and Linda's response has, I think, hopefully got to the heart of what this day has been about for me and hopefully for you, which is seeing things from another perspective, not just our own narrow perspective, 
going back to what Craig Calhoun was saying, and the importance of religion being at the heart of things. And we've talked a lot about the, the shifting public space and how that's requiring new ways of understanding religion and imagining religion. But nevertheless, the challenge is still there. And if William Temple was still here, he'd be saying those two things to us. See things from another perspective and make sure you're at the heart of things. So I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's been a long day, but I hope you found it a very fruitful day. Uh, it's been lovely to have you with us. Um, as Peter said at the beginning, please continue the journey with us if this is your first encounter with the Foundation. Uh, you would have found on your uh, seat the, today uh, a leaflet which explains what we try to do, uh, shows you and tells you how you can keep in touch with us through our website, through uh, signing up to our email uh, letter. Um, but also, we are, we are a small charity and we do uh, do a lot of work trying to kind of keep the, um, the legacy and ideas of Temple fresh and alive. So any financial support that you want to give us as well would be very welcome. And there would be other things that would come uh, as a result of that financial support. But please keep us in your prayers, keep us in your thoughts, keep us uh, interacting with us through our website. Uh, and we'd love to continue the journey with you. Uh, also, just very briefly, there is a, a flyer here for, if you like, uh, our next conference, uh, uh, kind of not exactly a follow-up to this, but certainly picking up on the themes that this conference has explored. It's a collaboration with the Church Urban Fund and the Joint Public Issues Team. It's going to be based in London on the 24th of February 2015. The conference is called Building a Politics of Hope, Exploring the Role and Impact of Faith-Based Leadership in Local Communities. And it will be case study focused, uh, but with a, a public lecture by Steve Chalk at the end of that event. So please do take that with you. And if you'd like to come, you can book already for that event. Uh, finally, really just a word of thanks. I'd like to thank you all for coming. As I've said, I'd like to thank all our speakers, all our contributors who've given so much today for our chair people. I'd like to thank this wonderful institution here and the way they've supported us. It's been a real privilege to be here. I'd like to thank our sound and vision guys. And if you were overwhelmed, as you probably were at sometimes, by the sheer volume and depth uh, of the material, it will be on our website for you to browse and peruse at your leisure, and we certainly hope to do so. Um, I'd like to thank my, my fellow trustees at the foundation, uh, our fellow research fellows, but above, above all, I'd like to thank uh, our assistant director, Charlotte, Charlotte Dando, who has worked incredibly hard to make this event happen in all its complexity, and as well as thanking all of you um, in the usual way, can we also thank her. Thank you very much. Well, drinks, drinks served in there. Yes, drinks are served in there, so please don't rush away unless you have to. Please have some wine. <laughs>